we live in the golden age of conspiracy theories. Now there's positive and negative aspects of conspiracy theorizing. Uh, some conspiracy theories, things that I regard as conspiracy theories, are actually quite mainstream, such as the idea of patriarchy and institutional racism. We'll get onto those uh, later. But before I go on to analyzing the idea of conspiracy theories, I thought I'd try my hand at making one up myself. Look at this story. Pentland Hills, mad cows attacking walkers and runners. Four attacks. What do you think's driving the cows crazy? What strange thing might be happening to the cows in the Pentland Hills? Well, in the BBC report, it said the cows were owned by the Scottish Rural College. The Scottish Rural College. Now, I know someone who works at the Scottish Rural College and he spends half his time there. The other half of his time he spends in Kenya working with cattle there. Guess who pays him to be over there? Guess who he's working with there? The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now you can see here the Scottish Rural College, you can see at the bottom there, funded by the Scottish Government and also they've got this international arm. You could read that. Health Research in Sub-Saharan Africa in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it's a fact that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is involved in developing vaccines for animals. So what else might be contributing to these cows going crazy when they've had their Bill Gates vaccines in the Pentland Hills? Well, what do you think of this? Okay, electromagnetic radiation, 5G. Well, look at these radio masts in the Pentland Hills. This is from the internet a couple of years ago. And the purple text there says, does anyone know what these are? It's all a bit of a mystery. It says, none of Dr. Muggleton's published papers make reference to his work at the Bog Hall Rheometer. No written record of his use has been found within the university. So it's not known if any significant results were obtained. Brian has also admitted to trace the project report compiled by Bruce Taylor, but it appears not to have survived. Sounds pretty secretive, does it not? So I wonder what was going on there. I wonder what sort of radiation they were testing in the fields of cows. I mean, those, uh, those electromagnetic transmitters are out of action now. But you can see here on the Google Earth, you can see a new one popped up at the other end of the Pentland Hills. It just makes you wonder, doesn't it? Join the dots, people. Join the dots. Right, Pentland Hills, Pentland Hills. Do you know how many words there are in the English language? 171,000. So what's the chance of finding something else with the same word? Well, one in 171,000, and yet here we are. Pentland Medical. Guess what they make money out of? Face masks for coronavirus. Here's a picture of one of them. That looks pretty scary, doesn't it? So we're not quite sure how this links in, but you can see we're, we're onto something here, aren't we? And if you're not convinced yet, this is the real clincher. You cannot argue with this. It cannot get any plainer. In the Pentland Hills, they have wooden hinged movable barriers in fences and walls so that people can pass through them from one side to the other. Guess who they're named after? What do you reckon? I reckon I could fool a few people on the internet. Now, I want to write conspiracy theories you know, with a capital C and a capital T. What I normally mean there is theories that there's not really evidence for. They're a bit far-fetched, but their adherence can be very passionate and it can become a bit of a hobby for some people. But on the other hand, conspiracy theories can turn out to be true. So there's been such a lot of them around for the last few months that I've been looking into it a little bit. I got a couple of books uh, and read them. Psychology of Conspiracy Theory is another book uh, as well. They're very interesting. So I'm just going to share a few insights from them particularly about the psychology of conspiracy theories and some other applications of that to the situations we find ourselves in today. So, number one, research finding number one. What sort of people believe conspiracy theories? Well, people who in general are distrustful. So if you test people with psychological tests to just to assess how much they tend to trust people in general, nothing to do with conspiracy theories, people who tend to trust people less are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories, which I suppose is common sense. That doesn't mean that conspiracies are true or false. Who knows what the optimum degree of trust or distrust of people is? But just that's the fact. More distrustful people 
are likely to believe in conspiracy theories. I mean, I would say in terms of the coronavirus vaccine, I mean, I've already had coronavirus, so you know, would I want to take the vaccine? I don't know, really, you know, we'll see. But I mean, have I got faith in the medical establishment, the researchers, the regulators? I would say overall I have. I'm fully aware of some of the difficulties there and some of the controversies that exist in those fields. But overall, I would say I trust them. Now, I know there's some people who would just be horrified to hear anyone say that. They'd say, you're so naive, you're just stupid to say you actually trust these people. Um, and I think that's a culture that can arise. The idea of trusting anyone can be can seen as really well, just naive and stupid. Whereas I think you know, a degree of trust is a good thing. Anyway, next point. People only believe in conspiracy theories about the other side. No one believes in conspiracy theories about the, about the political outlook that they have, for example. So if you look in America, um, there were no Republicans saying the Russians influenced the election when Trump got elected. There are no Democrats saying it's a fraud that got Joe Biden elected. Conspiracy, the conspiracy theories are only believed by people on the other side, if you see what I mean. Right, when do conspiracy theories arise? They tend to arise in situations of fear and uncertainty. Now again, that's not just something that people think they've seen happening. That's something that's been measured with psychological tests. You can put people in a state of fear and uncertainty as part of an experiment, and then you can measure their receptivity to conspiracy theories. And fear and uncertainty does make people more prone to believe conspiracy theories, and also more prone to blame other groups, which is often what conspiracy theories amount to. It's blaming a particular group or, or secret uh, group behind everything. Right, next one. So if that's the case, if fear and uncertainty make people more prone to believe in conspiracy theories, but if you believe in a conspiracy theory, that makes the world seem a bit more scary and uncertain because of these hidden forces manipulating things behind the scenes. So if people become more fearful and uncertain, they're more likely to believe more conspiracy theories. So it can become a bit of a, a vicious circle. Right, next point. Psychologists talk about something called the myth of self-interest. And what they mean by that is, in general, people find it difficult to believe that people are acting for other motives than self-interest. So if someone gives away a vast sum of money for a charitable endeavor, there'll be a substantial number of people who'll think, I don't believe it. Why did he really do it? What's in it for him? And I think we see that with some of the uh, philanthropists in the world at the moment, some immensely wealthy people who give huge sums of money to make the world a better place. In their eyes, you might not agree entirely on how they're gonna do it or the values uh, that they bring to that task, but that's basically what they're doing at face value. But a lot of people find that difficult to believe. It's interesting, and psychologists have shown that that tends to be an error in the human psyche. People tend to be distrustful of altruism and tend to see ulterior motives when they're not there. Right, next point. Lack of information fuels this myth of self-interest as well. So if you're told a story about someone who's given a, a vast sum of money to charity or whatever, or done something very altruistic, if the story's a bit vague and you haven't got the details, people are more likely to say, oh, I don't believe it. He's got some ulterior motive. He's in it for himself one way or another. Whereas if people have got more information about it, they're less likely to do that. And again, that's not a rational thing. It's not that the extra information provides evidence that it is genuine altruism. Just having more information makes people more trusting, which is uh, quite interesting. Here's another one as well from psychological research. Belief in conspiracy theories tends to be um, a trait of a person and they will believe conspiracy theories that are completely unrelated to each other. Now, there's a lot of uh, research done around this with the Millennium Bug. Remember the Millennium Bug? The idea that all computers were going to crash and nuclear power stations were going to explode, planes were going to crash, the whole world's banking system was going to grind to a halt, etc. I mean, this was taken very seriously. It was a pretty mainstream view. But people who were most concerned about the Millennium Bug were also the people who are most likely to believe in a range of conspiracy theories, which, as I said, are completely 
unrelated to each other. So it does seem to be characteristics of people that make them more or less prone to believe in conspiracy theories. Right, the next psychological effect. This is very interesting. It's called um, proportionality bias. People tend to think that if something had a really big effect, it must have had a really big cause, must have a really significant cause. So they've done experiments like this. So they'll say, for example, someone had written, uh, written up their PhD thesis and they were just about to print it up and the computer failed. So they couldn't print it out. So it was late being given in. But then the story would go on for half of the experiment. They'd say, but the, the professor said, oh, that's no problem, I'll give it in tomorrow. He gave it in tomorrow and it was all fine. Or alternatively, the story could go on to say, and the professor said, look, sorry, you've missed the deadline. That's an absolute deadline. You can't submit now until next year. You're going to have to do an, another year before you can actually submit the work. And then the groups were asked, what do you think caused this computer failure? And there'll be choices like innocent technical failures, like the fan broke or something, or other ones that suggest that it was deliberate, it was sabotaged. Which group were most likely to think it was sabotaged? The one who thought, well, it didn't really make much difference, or the ones who thought, well, this really had a big effect on the person's life. Well, the ones who thought this had a really big effect on the person's life, they were more likely to think that it was, might have been sabotage. Okay? So if you think about something like coronavirus, impact on the world, absolutely enormous, whereas uh, the, the cause of it, something very trivial, I mean, no one quite knows, but some just sort of mutation, some molecular change at random in some tiny little molecule somewhere in China, probably. So a very small cause with a big effect. People find it hard to believe that. So when there's a big effect, they tend to look for uh, a bigger cause for it, whether that's the actual cause or not. Now, conspiracy theories often involve belief in a sort of hidden power, a hidden cabal behind everything that are pulling the strings. Now, if, as soon as you believe one conspiracy theory that involves this hidden network behind the scenes controlling everything, then it opens people up to believe lots, lots more. Because anything else can probably be explained by the same hidden network of who knows who pulling the strings. So they tend to cascade one onto another. And that's another nature thing of the nature of conspiracy theories. They offer people, in some cases, a single explanation, simple explanation, that can then be applied to a whole range of different phenomena. So once you believe that there's you know, the network of people controlling it, whatever, then it can explain what happens to do with one political issue, then another one, then another world issue, another world issue. Everything can be explained in terms of this simple explanation, often without really evidence for it. But you can see the attraction of that, because it makes people feel that they've got an overarching understanding of what's going on, even though that might not actually be the case. Right, another interesting point with conspiracy theories, the people who are more likely to believe them are also people with spiritual beliefs. And I have to say, I've noticed on social media that often it is Christians who are taking up some of the recent conspiracy theories. Um, and some conspiracy theories that I don't think have got any credibility. So it's been interesting to see a lot of Christians uh, taking those up. Part of the reason for that, what might be related to it, is conspiracy theories appeal more to people with a more intuitive rather than analytic approach to issues. So more the gut feeling, how, how it feels, subjective approach, rather than really thinking it through logically. Now, I would say spiritual or religious beliefs can be intuitive, but they can also be logical and rational uh, as well. So I wouldn't um, draw any conclusions about the nature of spiritual beliefs from that. But it's a fact that people who are more intuitive are more likely to believe conspiracy theories. Right. Also, research has shown quite clearly that people who believe conspiracy theories are often willing to believe contradictory ones. So there's been research done. This is very interesting. So, for example, they say to people, so they say, do you think Princess Diana faked her own death? In other words, she didn't really die. She pre pretended and then actually lived on somewhere else. And then you also ask the same people, do you think Princess Diana was actually murdered? And the people who are most likely to think she faked her death and didn't really die are also more likely to say 
that they thought she'd been murdered. Similarly with Osama bin Laden, people who thought it was likely that he was actually already dead when the American troops went in and allegedly killed him, were also more likely to think that he's actually still alive. So it just shows that it's a propensity to believe the unorthodox account rather than a response to the evidence in those cases, uh, at least. I mean, other factors related to conspiracy theory belief, uh, people with higher education levels tend to believe uh, less conspiracy theories. I would imagine a part of that might be um, sort of developing critical thinking skills, developing their epistemology, the idea of uh, understanding the basis of which you believe things. Uh, another characteristic of people who tend to believe in conspiracy theories is a contrarian nature. People who just like to be in the min minority, like to be going against the flow, like to be the ones who've got the, you know, the unusual insight rather than just being part of the crowd. So if someone's of that nature, then conspiracy theories are very uh, attractive. Another interesting psychological point about conspiracy theories is the fact that people tend to see patterns in things when there aren't really any. So if people see a string of random numbers, and if you say, right, look at it for long enough, eventually people will find patterns and will tend to think that those patterns are deliberate or might have some meaning. And an experiment was done. I don't know if you know Jackson Pollock, American artist, that's debatable, who, who does pictures that look like you just you know, slung paint over it at random. They're just a total mess. And if they show people these pictures and say, can you see anything in the picture? The people who say, oh yeah, I think maybe, maybe that's a dog or that looks like a sunset over there. People who see something in the mess are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. It is uh, quite interesting. Also, if you're looking at something to see patterns, if you're in a situation where you feel you lack control, you're a bit concerned about what's going to happen. Again, they can simulate that in experiments in various ways. The people who are a bit unsettled, uncertain, a little out of control, are more likely to see patterns in things. So with coronavirus, again, you can see that fitting, can't you? That's something certainly people feel out of control to a large extent. And so in that situation, people are more likely to start spotting patterns that aren't actually there and to start believing conspiracy theories. I mean, another aspect of the human psyche that's very relevant is agency detection. Again, people in general will tend to err on the side of thinking there was deliberate agency. There was like in, an intelligent plan behind something when actually there wasn't. I and mean, I think that general uh, bias in human thinking tends to favor conspiracy theory thinking. Conspiracy theories, you might well have noticed, they never include incompetence. So if something goes wrong, it's never because people really didn't know what they're doing and they just messed it up. That never features. There's always going to be something deliberate behind it. Whereas in my experience, you know, people mess things up a fair amount of the time. So we need to allow for that as well. Another psychological trait that um, encourages conspiracy theories is confirmation bias. Once you believe something, you naturally tend to gravitate towards evidence that supports your existing belief. Now, in the internet age, this is a massive factor because you can, people can live in completely self-contained bubbles on the internet, having virtually no interaction at all with people with other belief systems. So confirmation bias combined with internet is a very powerful factor. Also, people don't bother with conspiracy theories unless it's in some way relevant to them or relatable to them. So, for example, if a plane crashes, people in Britain will think, you know, I've been on a plane. You know, I know, I know what that's like. So something about that, they'll, be, they'll relate to that. And maybe conspiracy theories will emerge. But if you look at the Rwandan genocide, for example, massive thing like that, no conspiracy theories. In, in Britain or Europe or the, or the Western world about that because it's not something that people relate to or feel as relevant or a threat to them in the same way. Right, so another factor with conspiracy theories is strong group identity leads people or makes people more likely to accept conspiracy theories. Now if you think about the recent history of the Western world and Britain, Scotland in particular, then there's been massive emphasis on strengthening group identity rather than national identity. 
So you've got, you know, the LGBT or, uh, and, and all this sort of thing. So the result of that is going to tend to make those groups more likely to see conspiracies where there perhaps aren't any. So with LGBT, you hear the idea that, you know, the, the NHS is homophobic. The education system is homophobic, whatever. I mean, really, it, it's, it's nonsense. Again, with feminism, feminism is saying to women, you know, you're a group and this other group, you know, the patriarchy. Does that not sound like a conspiracy? Men are conspiring to keep you down and we need to fight back against this. Are men really conspiring to keep women down? No. So then to a large extent, I think the patriarchy, the concept of patriarchy can be seen as a conspiracy theory. I mean, Al-Qaeda, their core message is that the West, the United States especially, they're on a mission to destroy Islam, which is completely false, it's completely rubbish. But that conspiracy theory is very powerful in some parts of the Muslim world, and that's what leads to uh, jihadism. You hear a bit in Scotland, you hear some Scottish nationalists saying, you know, they think the M MI5 is infiltrating uh, the Yes movement or whatever. So when group identity becomes very strong, it becomes an us versus them, that's fertile ground for conspiracy theories. Now on the same theme, race is a particularly interesting one here. Because in one of the books I was reading, it was talking about some of the conspiracy theories that have got quite wide currency among the African-American population in America. A substantial number of them believe that AIDS was created to kill black people. Uh, when there was uh, Hurricane Katrina, a lot of people believe, a lot of black people believe, that the government deliberately failed to contain the flooding in order to flood black majority areas. A lot of people believe that the government ensures that illegal drugs are available within black neighborhoods. 25% um, apparently of African Americans believe that the government sterilizes African Americans to cut the African American population. Now in the light of those, those, those are not like, you know, a couple of percent believe them, substantial portion of the population believe those. So within that context, you know, put George Floyd, I mean, what's going to happen? You can see that the conspiracy theory soil is very fertile indeed. As soon as people start blaming prejudice for their ills, then this sort of conspiracy theory is very likely. I would say the whole idea of institutional racism is in virtually every application is a conspiracy theory. There's not direct evidence for it, but there's not evidence for it, but it's believed because of the, this group, uh, group battle, group tension mindset leads people to believe those things. And I think the whole Black Lives Matter movement, I think if the theory that American police are violent towards, uh, you know, particularly violent towards uh, black people, if that was presented alongside um, the other conspiracy theories that are very widely believed in the African-American community in America, I think its credibility would be reduced very considerably. Right, next point. On the political spectrum, conspiracy theory belief is lowest in the middle, in the mainstream. If you go to the extremes, extreme right and extreme left, then that's where you find more conspiracy theory belief coming in. Okay, uh, no comment on that, that's just a, a fact. Um, believing conspiracy theories is also often a key part in radicalization. People who really go to, for example, violent extremes, often part of what they believe, it's not just passion about that issue, it's more than that, it's a belief that there are you know, deliberate forces at work behind it, which in a lot of cases there actually aren't. Another common feature with conspiracy theories, as you find before too long, you know, it's the global elite, it's whatever, and before too long you're starting to think actually what they're talking about is the Jews. And reading through history, I and mean, there's you know, thousands of years of history of this in Europe and, and different places around the world as well. Somehow or other, conspiracy theories seem to end up targeting the Jews. It was fascinating a few months ago, we put up a Scottish Family Party promotional video of a Family Party member um, it was filmed by my wife using my mobile phone and we put this on uh, on Facebook and YouTube and we spent a bit of money promoting it so people would be watching it coming across the Scottish Family Party for the first time 
I would say about maybe more than one in 10 comments suggested a conspiracy theory. I mean, they were absolutely, completely bonkers. People, a few people, a few separate people said, we think this is a front for the Conservative Party. So the Scottish Conservative Party have launched a rival party in order to benefit itself. Other people said they thought uh, it must be a new front for the Vote Leave organization. Other people thought it was a new, uh, a new like fake movement to help the nationalist cause by trying to split the unionist vote, apparently. People were saying, oh, this video is so professional. Where's your funding coming from? I bet it's coming from overseas. There must be some dark money involved here. They just get person after person coming out with this. It's just totally, totally nuts. But for a substantial portion of the population, that's their first reaction to seeing something new and unfamiliar. Now, conspiracy theories are renowned for being resilient. One of the reasons for that is they're obviously supposed to be unearthing something secret. So if it's secret, obviously you're not going to know much about it. Obviously most of it's hidden. You just go those little bits. So if someone says, well, you know, that's not enough evidence. Well, that's because the other evidence uh, is hidden. Some people call it the self-sealing nature of conspiracy theories. I think that's a good way of putting it. Inherent in their nature is a resistance to refutation. I think a very significant factor at the moment is conspiracy theory entrepreneurs. People who are making money out of them because these things are interesting to listen to. There's a huge market for it and that's going to lead to people meeting that demand in order to uh, make money. And what's tending to happen now is people who are presenting alternative media like this, a big part of their message is constantly trashing the some mainstream media, sometimes not even trashing the mainstream media, trashing the part of the alternative media that doesn't believe the, you know, the conspiracy theory that they believe in. Now in saying that, I'm not saying which conspiracy theories might be true or false, or whether the mainstream media or alternative media are telling the truth over a particular issue. I'm just saying that that's a very relevant factor to be aware of. Another important theme in conspiracy theory world is that experts are corrupted. And on any subject, if you think about say a medical thing, there are, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of doctors in the world. You'll always find there'll be a couple of experts who will take a very unorthodox view. That's just always going to be the case. So with any conspiracy theory, there will always be people with some letters after the name who can go with that. And for those experts, the attraction is it can be instant fame. You've suddenly got you know, thousands of people watching you on YouTube. It's a bit like bishops. If you're the most radically unchristian bishop in Britain, then that can be a route to fame. I mean, you, you know, you end up with your own TV show. You'll be in the newspapers all the time. If you're just in the mainstream, then you don't really get that sort of attention. I talked about the internet earlier on. I think YouTube diet, for example, do other social, other media as well, but YouTube diet can be a very significant factor because it's easy now to choose an area of interest, um, a line of thinking, if you like, and to immerse yourself for hour after hour after hour, listening the same sort of, to the same sort of messages coming through. In a way, I think that can be dangerous, it can overwhelm people's critical faculty. I mean, one example for this, if you watch the BBC, you get a constant stream of stories about how migrants are just such great people and what a marvelous contribution they make. Whereas some alternative media, you can get a constant diet of problems caused by migrants. Okay, is either of them a balanced picture? No, and it's not just migrants. If you did it for, for any group in society, you wouldn't get this sort of clear cut good or bad picture, it's very mixed. So we need to have a wits about us rather than just accepting what the editors decided to feed us with. In some cases, if we choose to on YouTube, say, you know, day after day, week after week, month after month. So why are conspiracy theories so popular? I mean, one of the reasons is that they're good stories. The person presenting it is like a detective story and effectively they're presenting themselves as the hero of the story. They are the ones who are unearthing the truth, you know, despite the, the, you know, the dangers that they're facing doing it. So that's the reason for their attracting. Again, that's not to say what's true and what's false. It's just that's a reason why people are attracted to conspiracy theories. Now, there are some positive things about conspiracy theory culture because sometimes there really are 
conspiracies. And when there are conspiracies, no one starts usually with the full evidence to really nail down exactly what's been going on. Someone might have a hunch or just a, you know, a snippet of evidence that raises the suspicion. So in that case, you'd want someone to take an interest, to keep investigating and to really find out about it and then to reveal the truth. I mean, that's, that's a really important thing to do. And maybe making more people aware of it might be part of that process. If more people are aware, then more people can help piece together the jigsaw. But ideally, what you don't want happening is someone presenting a theory that they haven't really got adequate evidence for, but presenting it in a way that's going to win people over to it. And you end up with like, thousands of people believing this as though there is really good evidence for it. So it uh, can be a mixed thing. Right, downside of conspiracy theories. Well, if we look in South Africa, uh, Tabu Mbeki believed some crazy conspiracy theory about AIDS drugs. He thought there was a US plot to poison African people. And so they weren't administered in South Africa and many, many people died for it. And another problem with conspiracy theories is it can lead to neglect of real issues. If people are worried about non-existent conspiracies or the wrong causes of various phenomena, then that means they're not going to be trying to tackle the real causes or the things that where they can actually make a difference. The other problem with conspiracy theories is someone who believes them can discredit their own side. So like the Labour Party in Britain has been discredited to a substantial degree by the prevalence of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories within it. But that applies to any viewpoint. If people adopt conspiracy theories that the broader population sees through and just thinks that's utterly ridiculous, then they can discredit the potentially valid points that that movement uh, would have. Just another example of the negative effects of conspiracy theory culture. I was listening to something the other day where drug companies can be quite secretive about the data they've got, about side effects, whatever. But even the regulatory bodies, sometimes they're reluctant to publish data about the side effects of drugs because they're worried it, it will get taken up by you know, conspiracy theorists, anti-vaxxers, whatever. It'll be all over the internet, might even be in the mainstream media. And most people are not really able to process the information adequately to realize that's actually a tiny risk. It's, it's not uh, a relevant factor or whatever. A lot of people are not able to see that. They just see the headline. You know, three people die after taking such and such a drug. And the regulatory authorities think, well, this is a problem. Overall, more people are going to die. There's going to be more suffering if we don't publish these. If we do publish the side effect data, that's actually going to lead to more harm in the population. So they're a bit reluctant to do so. Now, you may say that's a bad argument. They should release it in any case and try and argue their case. I mean, I've got a lot of time for that point of view. But it does illustrate the way that a conspiracy theory culture can lead to other problems like that. But in terms of vaccines, I mean, there are lots, lots of theories around and concerns around vaccines. I won't go into, into any of them, but I think there certainly is uncertainty because most people a vaccine just works by processes that aren't really understood at all. But there's one thing I'll predict here. I'll put my profit hat for a minute. When the coronavirus vaccine has been rolled out, millions of people will take it. In the months and years that follow, there are going to be countless claims that it's caused side effects. Now, maybe it will cause some side effects. I don't know. Okay? But whether it does or not, there will be countless claims that it has. Because lots of people will take it, the next day or next week, the next month, they'll develop some sort of condition or may feel they've developed some sort of condition. And then they'll put it on Facebook and we'll end up with Facebook groups or you know, online communities of people who are claiming everything under the sun was caused by the coronavirus vaccine. And this is going to be a massive problem, these claims in the years to come. So watch this space. The last point about the psychology of conspiracy theories, this is, is quite well attested, is that trying to argue with people who believe conspiracy theories is quite an uphill struggle, quite an arduous task. Partly because people who believe them have often got more invested in them than the people who are trying to talk them out of them. It becomes almost part of their identity, so they become quite angry. And they're always willing to go and do more research and find out more, find out more. Whereas the people who are against them, eventually they get to the stage where they think, oh, I just can't be bothered anymore. I'm not going to just keep researching and researching and researching just to respond to the latest nonsense they've come up with. 
and so they tend to back down. So there tends to be an imbalance, whereas conspiracy theorists are more committed to defending their ideas than anyone is to debunking them. Also, if you debunk one conspiracy theory, before you know it, another one's popped up right next to it. So you get this sort of whack-a-mole situation. So that imbalance tends to leave a lot of conspiracy theories relatively unchallenged. Now, just to wind up, I think we all should be open to deviating from the mainstream opinion when the evidence indicates that that's the right thing to do. But I think we shouldn't leap beyond the evidence to go to views just for the sake of it, just for the sake of always having to be different from the mainstream. I think the point about YouTube saturation is really important. I think we need to be very careful to see, are we thinking about, criti thinking about issues critically or are we just turning on the tap and allowing a constant stream of a particular viewpoint into our mind without really analyzing it and challenging it? Now I find here, any points I'm interested in, I find this really helpful to find debates where you've got people from both sides of the argument engaging with each other and that can really help to form a balanced view of the matter. Now in Scotland is quite hard I find you can't get anyone to debate a lot of these things but where you can find debates I find that can be really helpful. In terms of trust I would be inclined to say that uh, a tendency, a natural tendency, a natural stance of trusting people is probably good. If you think about the people you know are they trustworthy? Well, yeah, on, on the whole, yeah. Do they do good things, not out of self-interest? Well, yes, I mean, routinely on a, on a massive scale. Now, some people tend to think, oh, that's normal people, but the ones who run the country or run the world or whatever, they're, com they're a completely different breed and they're just you know, full of vindictiveness. Well, I don't really swallow that. Okay, power can corrupt you, I get all of that, but I don't think a stance of automatic distrust is justified. Now, I think it's really important that with the problems Scotland faces, and there's plenty of them, we can see where they come from. They come from faulty ideologies, faulty philosophies, and faulty strategies. We can see those, they're not secrets, they're out in the open. We can debate them, we can campaign politically about them. And conspiracy theories can be a distraction from that. Okay, the enemy is in plain sight a lot of the time in Scotland. And so that's where our energies should be focused. Well, I hope that was, uh, that was interesting. Occasionally I make a video like this about some books I've been reading and I've been bombarded with conspiracy theory material on social media for months now. So it's something that's been on my mind. So I thought I'd share some thoughts with you again. So hopefully I say that's been interesting and timely. Thanks for watching.